I think it's illegal. And some of you in this congregation, not me because I'm a preacher, they'll ignore me, right? But some of you in this congregation are going to be put in prison because of your faith. Some of you in this congregation are going to die because of your faith. Now, go home and be filled and be happy. How many people are leaving that church that day with the warm fuzzies? Huh? You see, I'm talking, I'm talking where the rubber meets the road here, folks. That if we're going to be true to the Lord, we're going to be willing to sacrifice and get out of our comfort zones and get out of this happiness thinking. Because too much in America is about happiness and too much of what we do, what we spend money on, what choices we make, and what decisions we make that many times allows us to not be faithful to the Lord because we're supposed to be happy. It's in the law, isn't it? You see, leaders cannot look at happiness as their motivation. Service is their motivation. But who wants to be a servant and slave, slave today? It's hard. It's hard to get people to say, I want to be a servant for Jesus. I want to be a servant for my family. I want to be a slave for Jesus. I want to be a slave for my family. And if you're not willing to be a servant and a slave for your family, don't sign up to be a father. And if you're not willing to be a servant and a slave for your church, don't sign up to be an elder. Don't sign up to be a leader. Because anything less than that won't please God. And over the long haul, won't be effective. And I was just talking to this lady about the fact that Talking about a church where everybody's happy, you know, they're all bouncing around, happy, bouncing off the walls, and you know, happy go lucky, and everything's funny, funny, and everything's great, and all, you know, and the preacher is just a great storyteller, tells a lot of good jokes, and once in a while he squeezes scripture in there when he feels the need to, you know, spirit moves him. But everything's about happy, 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 and all this is going on. I was just telling her, I said, that won't last. It won't last. Because once the government says you can't be a Christian anymore, Happy, happy is out the window. You see? Then I got to decide, like that Christian in the early first century church, that when the police have to go by and talk to you and say, Do you have your certificate? Did you offer sacrifice to the emperor this, this year? I don't have it. You better get it done. Because I'll come back to check up on you. Decision time, isn't it? Decision time. You see, we're at a point right now where our decisions don't seem to be quite that difficult and quite that important, quite that dangerous, but they are. Because you get in the habit of making decisions that let you off the hook, then it becomes a mindset and a program belief system, doesn't it? And you get in the, you get in the mindset of thinking, I'm going to do this for happiness. I like comfort. I like happiness. I like joy. I like recreation. I like all this kind of stuff. I don't want to do anything that's uncomfortable if I can help it, if I can avoid it. You get into that mindset, and pretty soon, <clears throat> it's just kind of automatic. And the brain sends up red flag. Uh-oh, don't do that, because that's not going to be comfortable for you. And uh, the brain cells send up another message. Oh, don't do that. Alert, alert, alert. Don't make that decision because you're going to be uncomfortable. You're going to have to face trials and tribulations. Don't make that decision. And our life becomes ineffective for the Lord. And as leaders, we are ineffective for the Lord and for the people who follow us. And when that happens, communication has no meaning anymore. And when that happens, then there is no more body. There's just individuals that seem to go to church, seem to be into it, and seem to be Christians. But they're not. I don't think in all my life, I've been preaching uh, for 41, 42 years, 71 years old. I don't think all of my lifetime, I can remember a time that's full of peril for the Christians I do right now. I can't remember a time. I don't want this to be a downer. I don't want you to leave here with the downers, you know. I'd rather you leave here with warm fuzzies. <laughs> That's not my job. It's not Micah's job. His job is to build you up in the, in the Lord. If that takes sometimes discipline and rebuke, then that's what he does. But he's also to exhort. Paul says both rebuke and exhort is what preachers ought to be doing. You see? And so what we're talking about now is real life stuff. Not just for, love, for elders, for, but for people. To take responsibility and 
to realize that the choices they make, the things that we do, cannot be based on happiness. If happiness comes, that's great. Let's enjoy it. If it comes because of decisions we make and so forth, that's great. Let's enjoy it. But let it always be a byproduct. And never, never a goal. Let it always be something that God blesses us with from time to time. But never a goal. I remember years ago, when my kids were home, young, and uh, we went out to Donald Bay camp for one day, I think it was just kind of one of these normal days where they went out there for some kind of get together or whatever it was, I can't remember exactly. And my middle son, bless his heart, I love him to death, but he was always adventurous, you know. Got a couple of grandkids like that, but that's okay. <laughs> And I had just bought a brand new Rosemobile station like, Oh, it was beautiful. And I got in that thing and smell it, you know. And oh, boy, I was enjoying that. Brand new. And I loved that car. It smells so good. Got out there, parked it. Let everybody look at it, you know, all that kind of business. Feeling pretty proud that day. Wow, that's a pretty car. Everybody's looking at it and everything. Late in the afternoon, my son said, Can I, is that your car open? I said, it's open. I didn't think about it. So, it's probably about 89 degrees, about 80 degrees that summer afternoon. He'd been out looking at things, he always did, you know, and he found... <laughs> what do you call those things? Gooey duck. Gooey duck. I hate to mention the name, but anyway. <laughs> it's kind of messy. He found a gooey duck. And he thought, that's nice to take that thing home. <laughs> you know, isn't that some cute one? So he picked it up. And he took it back to my nice new Oldsmobile station wagon, set it in there close the door. Oh, no. <laughs> it never smelled the same. <laughs> in fact, it seemed like I had, I don't know if I told Sandra or not, but I had visions. Let's go home and sell this car right now by now. <laughs> you see what happens so fleetingly and so quickly? Things in this world, you know, that we get caught up in. And the next day, it's misery because you've got to make the payments, you know. And, and the circumstances of this life, we get so caught up in, in, in trying to do things that make us feel good, make us happy and all. And I'm not saying we shouldn't try to be happy and feel good. I'm not saying any of that. I don't, I don't mean that. <clears throat> what I mean is it depends on my mindset, what I'm thinking. If I'm making decisions <coughs> that meet my needs, make me happy, make me feel good, if that's the primary criteria for the decisions I make, I'll not be a good leader. I'll not be a good father or mother, and I'm not being a Christian. It just doesn't fit. It just isn't there. Everything that you read in Scripture is all about taking responsibility. In it. And you think about it, taking responsibility before God. God is not going to save you just by being irresponsible and thinking somehow He's going to save me. I'm irresponsible, but then somehow He'll save me. Why? Because I'm a victim. <laughs> and our government saves victims, doesn't it? So God ought to do the same thing. No, he doesn't. <clears throat> Victimization is not an excuse before God. So we need to take responsibility. I said there's a few things that you'll see throughout the Bible that God emphasizes. One is humility. And another one is self-control. And the people in the Bible that didn't have it, you know the problems they got into. The Abrahams. The Davids. And go on and on it goes. And God continually says, have self-control. You have no excuse for not having it. You have no excuse for allowing your emotions to control you. They're going to happen. It's going to happen sometime. We all do it at moments. We are succumbing. We succumb to jealousy. We succumb to anger. We succumb to rage. Maybe it's another thing. It happens from time to time. But you don't let your life be controlled by that. And you are able to communicate with people without being threatened. And you are able to communicate with people and helping them find solutions to their problems. And that means at times when there are solutions in the church that you have to come to through problem solving, then sometimes you sacrifice your own feelings and desires because you're sacrificing them for the body. And each one of us has four elders. Whenever we leave, and I travel, of course, I'm gone more than the rest of them. We have one, we have one elder who's a businessman. He travels quite a bit. But we always say, when we're meeting that day, now that Wednesday for the, for the week, we always say, okay, I'm going to be gone here. I'll be gone there. Yep, whatever decision you make, my decision when I get back. Now, there's a couple of decisions I wish, I wish you didn't make, you know. I mean, hopefully you'll not make those dumb decisions. No, I didn't say that. 